Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to this week's Saddleback webinar. This is part two in a two-part series around English learners with disabilities. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational. And I know we're doing this webinar at a little bit of a different time today. Uh, right in the middle of the workday for a lot of you. So if you are joining us, we wanna say thank you for making time to be here. But we know a lot of our fans are going to be joining us on the recording. So uh, welcome to all of you joining us uh, from, from the future, I guess. Um, we, as usual, are starting a little bit early because we want those of you who are hopping on to just have some time to locate the control bar and especially locate the chat and the Q&A area that's there on your control bar. So in the chat area, this is where you'll get to interact with all of your fellow attendees. Just please be sure that when you type something in the chat area, there's a little drop down there. You wanna make sure that it says all panelists and attendees, that way everybody can see what you're saying and can, we can really facilitate the conversation that way. The chat area is also where we will be dropping links to resources and handouts that our presenters have so graciously shared with us today. So be on the lookout for those as well. Now the Q&A area, that's where we would love for you to drop any questions you have. Sometimes people put questions in the chat area and that's okay, but it takes us a little bit longer to get to, get to them if they're in the chat area. If you put them in the Q&A area, that helps us be efficient with responding to your questions. So any question you have either for Saddleback or for our presenters today, please use that Q&A icon on your control bar. As usual, we want to encourage you to follow us on social media. We know many of you are on Twitter, so please go to Twitter, shout us out, let everybody know you're joining us today. Our speakers, Tammy Sanchez and Chara Christopher are also on Twitter. You can see their information here. So go ahead and let everybody know that you are here and that you are excited for this great learning opportunity today. We'll get started right at about five minutes. So let's check in and say hello to our speakers today. Hello, Chara. Hello, Tammy. How are you? Good morning. Great. Thanks, Liz. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. This is a nice change in routine to have our webinar a little bit earlier in the day. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for your time and making time to join us to, to do this presentation today. Now, we're all in Texas. So usually our presenters are in different parts of the country, so we get to chat about the weather, but I know what the weather is like where you are. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's a little bit uh, unseasonably warm, I'm guessing, right? <laughs> yeah, I could be, I think we could say it's like August again. It's, you know, 90 degree high today. I'm, I had my sweaters out, so I'm not sure what to make about this. I know, I it's, it's a little unfair. I will, I will say that. Um, so, uh, our, our participants are already at it. I was just getting ready to say, go on to the chat, let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, and I open the chat and people are already talking to each other. So if you haven't already, let us know where you're joining us from. We have uh, a lot of folks in Texas who I think know our speakers today and are interested in uh, hearing what they have to say. We have West Virginia in the house, Southern California, of course, that's where Saddleback is located, Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, San Antonio, Texas, New York Public Library, Nova Scotia, hello Canada, Grand Prairie, Texas, New Jersey, all right, Maryland, Cleveland, Ohio, Lower Alabama, okay, Toledo, Ohio, Chicago, excellent. Do we have anybody, oh hi West Palm Beach, do we have anybody from uh, New Jersey or Pennsylvania? That's where our speaker from part one last week where, where she was joining us from. We have Wisconsin, Oh, this is so fun. I'm, I'm really thrilled that uh, we have, hi, Kim from New Jersey. Thanks for letting us know that you are, you are here with us. I did see somebody at the very top say um, uh, about the first webinar. Um, yes, the first webinar we did on the originally scheduled day, we had some internet issues, so we rescheduled it for Friday. And if you missed it, it's on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to check it out there. Don't worry, you'll still be able to access that. Aloha from Hawaii, great. We have a great showing today. This is, this is wonderful. Uh, Georgia, Virginia, we've got Arlington. This is wonderful. So those of you who are joining us today, can you just uh, drop in the chat area what you're teaching? This will give our speakers a little bit more information about our audience. K-8 ESL, school psychologist, ninth grade English, 
K2 special education, secondary EL. Okay, pre-K uh, evaluation team lead, ESL coordinators, speech pathologist, assistant principal, director of bilingual ed, um, child study team, literacy specialist, learning specialist, uh, ELL intervention specialist, resource teacher, uh, six through eight ESL civics and geography teacher, pre-K through eight special needs EL teacher. I've got another school psychologist. So this is giving you an idea of uh, who's joining us today. Eligibility coordinator, that's interesting. Uh, bilingual and ESL director. Imperial County SELPA coordinator, okay. Wonderful, thank you all so much for joining us. Oh, we've got some reading specialists too. Okay, well, I hope all of you had a chance to catch part one. Um, if you didn't catch part, part one, before this webinar, that's okay. These are not necessarily um, sequential webinars. You can view them in, in either order and I think you'll find value um, in, in both. So we even have some higher ed folks joining us today, uh, a professor of special education. So thank you so much to our audience for being here. Um, we're, as usual, we're thrilled and we're honored that you're taking the time to join us. Um, with that being said, let's officially launch for the day. So our topic today is providing equity and access for English learners with disabilities. How do we do that? This is a hot topic and it's a complex topic, but what we do know is that a lot of what's going on right now is not working. Why do we do the things we do? Have we thought about that? Is it just because that's the way we, we've always done it? Uh, and if that's how you find yourself answering that question, uh, we need to stop and reflect. And I think our speakers today are going to have some, some great uh, reflection points and some great wisdom and expertise to share with you. So joining us today, we have Tammy Sanchez, who is joining us from Duncanville ISD in Texas, where she is a bilingual and ESL coordinator. And also Chara Christopher is joining us from Dallas ISD, where she is an EL and SPED instructional specialist. Let me tell you just a little bit more about uh, these fabulous professionals, uh, and then I'll turn it over to them so they can get started. So um, Tammy has 18 years of experience in education, serving in special education, bilingual ESL, and special education for English learners. She holds a BA from South Dakota State University in, in Spanish and education, and a master's in educational administration. And Chara earned her bachelor's degree in special education from the University of North Texas, her master's degree in school counseling, and her LPC, licensed professional counselor from Lamar, from Lamar University. She has worked in elementary and secondary programs for English learners, special education, English learners with disabilities, credit recovery, and dyslexia. So a wide range of experience here. Uh, these two have known each other for a long time. They stand behind an educational philosophy centered on social justice education through breaking down barriers and ensuring equitable access to instruction for all students. Tammy and Chara's career highlights include leading Dallas ISD's initiative to improve services and programming for English learners with disabilities. Who better to speak to this subject? Ladies, thank you so very much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, I'll circle on back at the end and join you for, um, to, for facilitating questions at the end, all right? Thanks, ladies. Great, thank you. Well, hello and thank you again for joining us today. Um, and thank you to Liz and Tim and Saddleback for hosting us. So before we begin, I want you to think of our title and the acronym TWADI. Have you heard that before? Please start thinking about it and how it applies to today's topic. Don't worry, we'll be circling back around to it. I also want to point out on the very top, there's um, a link for a resource folder. Um, it has a wealth of ideas and documents that we'll reference today. And we will have the link up at various times during the presentation. All right, so today we're going to cover the following topics. Know your who, changing the script, resources, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers. As we begin our journey with this PD, we will encounter several key vocabulary terms that we're going to use during our discussions. The following terms are English learners with disabilities, admission review and dismissal committee, which is ARD in Texas and maybe IEP team in your state. And lastly, language proficiency assessment committee or LPAC in Texas. 
Um, this is the team that oversees the English learner plans and programs for a campus and district. You may have already um, encountered or heard of some of these key terms. Um, please keep them in mind as we go through our activities today. All right, my colleague Chara is going to lead us into our next section of Knowing Your Who. Hanging hashtags is an elevation strategy that can be used with your students as a simple follow-up, introduction, or assessment of learning. Remember in the beginning when Tammy asked for you to think about our title, the acronym TWADI? For our presentation today, Tawadi means that's the way we've always done it. In each of our professional careers, we can say that we have heard or have been guilty of using this phrase as justification of why we do what we do. But after today, we say no more. Please take a moment and reflect on the quote on the screen. As I read the quote aloud, please create a hashtag that applies to our topic and place it in the chat. As you type your hashtag, look at the ones of those who uh, are your other peers in the chat. Here we go. English learners are the fastest growing group of students in US schools, and nearly 15% of them are identified as having disabilities, yet, they are disappropriately underserved and underachieving. This diverse group of over 1 million students brings important cultural and linguistic access assets to the public education system, but also face, faces greater likelihood of lower graduation rates, academic achievement, and college enrollment than their non-L peers. It is our hope that you have joined this impactful session in order to disrupt the systems of Tawadi. That's the way we've always done it, in order to provide equity and access for English learners with disabilities, students. Now that we've established the importance of academically supporting English learners with disabilities, it is important for you to know that we, as ESL, bilingual, shelter teachers and paraprofessionals have the skills needed to help English learners with disability students be successful. So who are English learners with disabilities? I'm glad you asked. Um, as you look at the images on the screen, take note of the differences. Native English speakers without disabilities need to only focus on content as shown in the image to the left. English learner students without disabilities have content and language struggles as shown in the, image, in the middle image. In the last image, we see students who must focus on three areas that can impede their access to the general education curriculum. These are our English learners with disability students. And as you can see, our students have three unique perspectives that they're struggling with. Let's look closer at our English learners with disability students. An English learner with disability student is in the process of acquiring English and has qualified for special education services with a documented disability. This student requires services and supports in order to access the general education curriculum. So keep in mind, accommodations or modification per modifications per the student's individual education program may also be needed. It is important to note students who struggle with content, language, and cognitive disabilities may need more direct instruction in order to gain meaningful assets to the curriculum. Our English learners come from a variety of backgrounds and cultures. They could be SIFE students, newcomers, immigrants, refugees, unidentified students sitting in your classroom, or they could be in gifted and talented programs. English learners who receive special education services must have both language needs and disability needs addressed. One does not take priority over the other. They are entitled to both services and should not be made to choose one over the other. Think about the impact to teaching and learning in order to make sure that English learners with disability students 
are not marginalized. And when I say marginalized, I mean, they're not being pushed over into the margins. Knowing your data is an important key to identifying potential over and under identification of English learners with disability students. Nationally, 15% of L's are identified as English learners with disabilities. In Texas, we are at 9%. In Duncanville, where Tammy is, they are at 9% um, as well, with approximately 200 English learners um, students. But in, in Dallas, we are the 14th largest district in the nation. We are at 8%, which represents approximately 5,600 students. So please be aware that within states and nationally, identification rates may vary. Um, different regions may have higher or lower percentages based upon approaches and practices. So for example, in 2014, California had a rate of 31%, while Vermont had a rate of 2%. So use this time to reflect on the question presented and place your answer in the chat. Based on your knowledge and level of understanding, what support and services may English learners with disabilities need for equitable access to instruction? So many ideas on how you can change your systems to better serve students. Now we will explore our next system with Tammy. All right, thank you, Tara. Well, let's do it. Let's begin disrupting the systems, breaking free of Tawadi, and making sure that we're providing equity and access for English learners with disabilities, uh, really working to change the script. So with that, and keeping with our theme, hashtag Tawadi, and I loved the responses, by the way, in the chat, um, no more Tawadi, that was fun. I need a bumper sticker that says that. Um, so we're gonna play a little game, okay? We're gonna look at some common practices and beliefs um, and determine if they're a fact or a myth. So we'll show you a statement on the screen and feel free to enter in the chat, fact or myth. Ready? All right, let's do it, let's play. So fact or myth, ARD committee decisions trump LPAC decisions. All right, that's right. The chat's going wild. That is a myth. The truth is that all educators work together for the benefit of all students. Everyone has a seat at the table when developing the educational plan and program for the student. Sometimes it can be a little confusing because decisions for students with disabilities must be documented in the IEP. In summary, we're all on the same team with the same goal. So we wanna share how we um, went about disrupting the system at the district level. As professional colleagues, we knew that the work could not be done in separate departments. We intentionally joined forces across a variety of departments um, and moved forward together towards our common goal. So we broke free of Tawadi and established a new and improved system. Not perfect, but improved. And to do that, we needed a framework and a plan. So one of the first steps was to outline exactly how to collaborate so it would be intentional, purposeful, and concrete. So you likely have been part of uh, many different situations um, and examples on the continuum of what collaboration looks like. We, uh, we didn't want to leave it to chance or interpretation on what it means within this context. So within our framework, we defined and outlined steps to collaborate. Remember, collaboration and planning are a team effort. Teachers, um, they should remain focused on student success and honor and appreciate how each teacher brings his or her expertise to the partnership. The special education teacher provides direction um, regarding the instruction of students with disabilities. And the L teacher provides knowledge on the process and education within the language acquisition process. As the saying goes, we're better together. Remember, the collaboration of the students, teachers, it has to be regular and ongoing in order to discuss student data, plan instructional activities, and monitor student um, progress. 
Together in that collaboration and planning phase, the teachers can identify specific content and or skills that can be taught or reinforced by both the L teacher and the special ed teacher. This will ensure that the instruction is consistent between the teachers and prevent gaps, redundancies, and or conflicts. So next, what we did is we clearly defined the roles of the LPAC representative in the IEP meeting. This framework helped guide the decisions in the IEP meeting. There are many language acquisition based decisions made in an ARD meeting that impact a student's education in multiple ways, um, such as linguistic goals, instructional approaches, language acquisition programs and services, reclassification criteria, and local and state assessments. Again, to make sure that we didn't fall back into Tawadi, we set a clear plan to ensure that ongoing collaboration of the SPED team and the L team. We defined how collaboration looks and the roles of each person. With that, uh, we wanted to make sure that time was set aside <clears throat> and meaningful discussions were taking place. This can't happen if the only time that the teams talk about the student um, is at the IEP meeting or 10 minutes before it. So it's important that the SPED and L representatives have, um, have time set aside to meet regularly and review the needs of the student. Setting an agreed upon system for that will assist greatly. These are two examples of forms that our districts use in the collaboration process. And the intent is to align the L plan with the IEP. Remember, all decisions for students with disabilities must be documented in the IEP. The collaboration forms guide, um, guide the discussions and the decisions for the IEP development, such as accommodations, instructional programs, and state assessment decisions. Another thing that we did um, that was align the accommodations on the collaboration form and what is in our LPAC uh, data management system and our SPED data management systems. So this way all three were aligned with the same options and the um, showed on, on the paperwork the same. And this helped um, prove much more effective for the teachers um, in planning. These examples of these forms are in the resource form uh, folder that we have linked for you. I am a special education educator and I do not speak a second language. Therefore, I am unable to provide assistance in the bilingual ESL classroom. Is this a fact or a myth? Go ahead and put in the chat. That's right, it is a myth. The truth is the student deserves and is entitled to services from both programs. The blue slides to the left showcase the learning experience every child should receive titled High Yield Instructional Strategies. High Yield Instructional Strategies are best practices determined by the teacher, like small group, supplemental aids, differentiated instruction. All students, including students with disabilities, receive these instructional strategies. The green slides to the right showcase specialized instruction. Specialized instruction focuses on meeting the specific needs of your diverse learner. Does their content need adapting? How about the delivery of instruction? Does it need to be in English, Spanish, or another language? What does the IEP say? The goals and objectives. Are there related services, accommodations, or modifications? So this is what we say to ourselves, self, what specialized interventions, supports are needed to fill the gaps in these students learning and help them gain academic success? So let's look a little bit deeper into specialized instruction. Let's begin by examining the different areas for differentiated instruction. Differentiated instruction begins with knowing your students and their individual needs. It's all about student learning and ensuring that students have access to the content. We will focus on these four ways. Content, process, product, and 
learning environment. First, we'll start with content. Content is what the student must learn. What does the student need in order for him or her to learn and gain access to the information? The aim is student learning and ensuring that all students have access to the content. The process and the product may change, but the content is the constant, is the constant. High expectations for all students. Differentiating instruction can be accomplished in the online setting as well as the face-to-face -face whole group lesson. Providing differentiated instruction in the online setting, you can use um, video conferencing tools such as the Google Meets, Teams, Webex, Zoom, um, just allowing, this is your platform for accessing the information that they need to know. Um, embedding YouTube videos in order to create um, a reteach or fill in the gaps or offer personalized instruction. Um, in our district, um, the ESL department selects supplemental online instruction licenses to help the parents and the um, students of English learners who receive special education services in order to fill gaps and increase student engagement, language acquisition, supplemental um, extended learning opportunities to improve that achievement and instruction and then grow that student's listening, speaking, reading, and writing fluency in English. Next, we're going to look at the process. How the student engages in learning. What activities will be used to engage the student and aid the student with mastering the content and being able to make sense of it? So teachers can support with how-to video um, tutorials, chunking assignments, providing um, additional guidance with questions, using um, reframing questions, embedding questions, or checks for understanding um, in videos such as Nearpod and um, Edpuzzle allow you to do things like that. Using visual examples such as Flipgrid or Quizlet or um, Seesaw. The product it's how the student demonstrates and conveys their learning, how they let you know that they have understood and mastered the content. So keep in mind, there are a variety of ways students demonstrate their knowledge. So be flexible, um, allow for their product to be manipulated. And when I say that, I mean um, students can demonstrate their learning by creating um, a slide deck or a PowerPoint presentation. They can do a YouTube video, um, allow students to work in groups or individually, correct rubrics, and then allow them to produce their own element of the rubric within that group. Um, allow students to resubmit or retake um, assignments as needed, projects or exams, because this is what allows the student to practice, rehearse, apply, and extend their learning. Um, as a teacher, we can model, demonstrate um, what the student needs to do, and then we can watch for misconceptions and errors. The learning environment is the tone of the classroom. Considering how the class works and feels, honoring students' cultures and allowing the student to see themselves in the classroom. For families who've chosen virtual and online learning, this learning environment is already differentiated because it's a shift from the face-to-face -to, -face to online. Um, the students can choose where to work at home, um, what best fits for them. Um, the teacher can set guidelines as to how to create and submit assignments using the Google tools, um, calendars, checklists, and whatnot. Online timers can be set to help the student gain, um, keep focus. We can use vis visual examples through, you know, um, rides or the Google suit or, again, those timers. In summary, we disrupt the systems to provide equity and access for English learners with disabilities through differentiation. Differentiation provides opportunities for students to learn in a way that is right for them. This is also very beneficial for our English learners who receive special education services. Differentiation provides options and opportunities for all students in both in-person and virtual learning. It maximizes student growth, their individual success, 
and provides options and opportunities for all students. Now, it's time to dig deeper. If you have not started paying attention to this diverse student population, let's start the conversation today. Okay, here we go. Next one, factor myth. Bilingual instruction is confusing for English learners with disabilities and they should be removed from bilingual education programs. Factor myth. All right, what do you think, Chara? That's right, this is a myth. So many times educators and parents mistakenly um, decide to add more English and subtract the native language to the student's instructional program in hopes that this will help increase English proficiency. The truth is that a student's L1 native language positively impacts L2, the second language. This relationship between native language proficiency and English language acquisition benefits all students, including students with disabilities. In order to disrupt the system to provide equity and access for English learners with disabilities, the focus of our initial work included awareness, education, and professional development. So one key piece of information to guide the work um, is from the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Education. The slide here quotes um, guidance which reminds and clarifies for school districts of their legal obligation to ensure that L students can participate meaningfully and equally in their educational programs. Um, the entire document is about 40 pages long and we have added that in the resource folder for you. So similar guidance is published in our state's administrative code and likely is in yours too. It outlines the requirements for serving L's with disabilities or duly identified students and ensures that students are not refused services due to a disability. So one statement that we would often hear um, from both L teachers and special education educators is that the special, edu uh, special education teacher does not speak Spanish and therefore couldn't provide services to their students. So we knew that we needed an immediate plan to stop this from happening and to guide the teachers on how to do this to provide equitable access to SPED services for ELS. So with that, we created a guide for serving students receiving SPED services in the elementary dual language program. The guide provides information specifically to the special education teacher about the use of data for IEP development, the dual language program, uh, the special education continuum of services and instructional planning. It offers clarifications and supports to help teachers in the planning and collaboration phase of helping ELLs with disabilities gain access to the curriculum through the services they are entitled to. So in addition, uh, we researched and created a document on instructional strategies to support ELLs with disabilities is organized around language acquisition methods, including providing comprehensible input, providing individual guidance, drawing on prior knowledge, and providing meaningful access to the curriculum. It's an easy to read one page document that we used um, in training teachers, and we also give it um, as a guide with exemplars on best instructional practices. So both this document and the previous one are in the resource folder that we've created for you. Get your fingers ready. Fact or myth? A student's culture and background have no influence on their academic learning and language acquisition. That's right. It is a myth. The truth is, validating a student's language and culture and then using it as an asset to bridge learning, that is how we disrupt the systems to provide equity and access for English learners with disabilities. Often in state education agencies, we enjoy hosting multicultural celebrations, right? Like Cinco de Mayo, Lunar New Year, St. Patrick's Day, MLK Day. 
while this is a great starting point, there is so much more that we can do to honor our students' culture daily. So for example, our curriculum and instruction team includes culture in daily PowerPoint lessons. So we use like Jose Medina's um, four plus one chart, um, native text, where students see themselves and their story and the lessons and assessments. Um, it's important to remain asset focused, student centered, um, value native languages, cultures, and experiences of our students. Culture is fluid. We must help our students develop a sense of identity, voice, and then allow them to make choices about what they believe and how they want to be identified. Our LMS system gives us a glimpse of the student's academic present level of performance. However, it does not include the student's cultural, and, um, cultural background and experiences. Therefore, as equity focused in educators, it is important to explore the dimensions of equity. So first we have multicultural education. And that focus on celebrating diversity. Next you see um, social justice education, which is about raising the students consciousness about in um, inequalities in everyday social environmental and political aspects of life. And then finally, you see culturally responsive teaching, which focuses on improving the learning capacity of diverse students who have been marginalized educationally. So we want to include these three um, in daily instruction to provide equity and access to the general education curriculum to avoid the marginalization that we've talked about before. The state of Texas noticed that um, English learners are the fastest growing student population in the state. In order for this diverse, in order to address and support this diverse student population, the state of Texas developed a resource um, and it was titled Writing Culturally Relevant IEPs. Now the IEP is the guide for instruction for the English learner with disability. As a district, we disrupted the systems to provide equity and access for English learners with disabilities by developing a resource called the Writing Culturally Relevant IEPs Companion Tool to support the teachers with the state document and then to ensure culture and language proficiency is included when developing the individual education program. So you'll notice the following features included. IEP components, features to include when writing the culturally relevant IEP. It'll have resources there. And then what we found the most helpful was the exemplars. Another way we validate the student's language and culture and then use it as an asset to bridge the learning and disrupt the systems to provide and access for English learners with disabilities is to provide parent webinars, um, parent academies, um, external educational opportunities, literacy fairs to support students and families of who are um, English learners who receive special education supports. My colleague Tammy is going to discuss our next section on MTSS and referrals for disabilities. Thank you, Char. Okay, factor myth. We have to wait for ELLs to develop proficiency in academic language prior to referring for evaluation to determine if the student is a child with a disability. That's right, this is a myth. The truth is, um, the truth is, if any student, including ELLs, has a suspected disability and or is not responding to interventions provided in the instructional setting, she should be referred for evaluation for disability. There is no need to delay the process which could potentially withhold services. So I do want to focus on the key phrase, suspected disability. There are situations where a student's disability is more apparent 
such as deaf, hard of hearing, blindness, uh, nonverbal, etc. The following slides are geared towards um, when a student's disability or possible disability isn't as easily apparent and a school really isn't quite sure what's causing the student's struggles. So as you set out to provide equitable systems, a strong pre-referral system with a cultural and linguistic considerations embedded is necessary. Best practices in RTI include a problem solving period, including specific interventions lasting at least six to eight weeks over, um, over at least two cycles of interventions. And I was just thinking about how the presenter from last week really went into depth on this topic too. Um, this inter this uh, cycle and the data collection provides an opportunity to gather preliminary information and attempt interventions in that regular classroom setting. So culturally and linguistically diverse students may have learning and or behavior problems due to adapting to a new culture and or language rather than um, problems due to a possible disability. However, on the other hand, a disabling condition that is masking or aggravating their adaptation to that mainstream curriculum may also be present. So that brings us back full circle, right? To the necessity of interventions and data gathering during the problem solving period with consideration of the sociocultural needs of the student. Research shows and supports that intervention will satisfactorily address approximately 70% of the teacher's concerns about the diverse student. And we do want to just give a quick disclaimer, you know, make sure to follow your, your district's procedures on RTI and MTSS, you know, and as the language expert, bring in that language learner lens to the discussion. So as you're providing interventions, remember we're trying to address possible causes for the learning differences. Data collection is so important in the process, especially with a focus on knowledge and skills not just English proficiency. So when possible, try to obtain data on if the student can perform the skill in his native language and or if retaught in his native language, can he show understanding? Also consider the profile of true peers, students with similar backgrounds. How does the student's performance compare to that of like peers? Again, last week the presenter went into depth on different profiles. So as we talked about earlier, we need to create classrooms that validate a student and that are welcoming. Um, this in the environment, right, needs to lend itself to learning um, by lowering that effective filter. And lastly, it's important to view a student's results and behavior across settings. Earlier, we talked about how collaboration is key. So establish relationships with colleagues who can help interpret what you're seeing and noting on the student's performance. Um, also, of course, don't forget to use parents as a source of valuable information. Ask for their input and help. In the problem solving period, we note different concerns and try to figure out what's the root cause of this struggle. So as we've stressed, it's important to have a system in place so we don't mistakenly misinterpret the language acquisition process as a language or learning disability. A great tool to assist with this process is from the US Department of Education. We have linked that in the resource folder. So let's look at an example together, actually two. So the first one, it says, um, the indicator, student appears inattentive and or easily distracted. So let's look at the indicators of a possible learning disability. Student is inattentive across environments, even when language is comprehensible, may have attention deficits. Now let's look at the indicators of difference due to a second language acquisition. Student does not understand instructions, instructions in English across settings due to the level of proficiency, improves over time with um, supports. Note how both of them indicate results from interventions and accommodations given over time and or across settings. So let's look at a second example. It reads, does not understand key words, phrases, poor comprehension. So as the team is considering this along with other data, the indicators could point to two possibilities. Let's look at the first one. It reads, the students uh, under possible learning disability, the student's difficulty with comprehension and vocabulary is seen in both L1 and L2. 
And the second one in orange, um, indicators of a language difference due to second language acquisition, lacks understanding of vocabulary and meaning in English. So this is a great example of how using native language resources and reteach um, could help clarify the root of the problem. So as you're helping your team break free of Tawadi and build a better system, please remember this toolkit from the US Department of Education. It has a great starting point in there um, to use to bring that language learning considerations um, to the discussion. And again, it is in the uh, resource folder. So as we stated earlier, research shows that intervention will satisfactorily address the majority of concerns. But what about when it doesn't, right? What about when RTI doesn't yield the progress? This is where you'll meet the fork in the road. One direction is, as a committee, discuss how the intervention should change in frequency, intensity, duration, and or the professional delivering it. Again, we recommend at least two cycles of interventions. This will help yield data that you need to make those informed decisions. The other possible direction for the committee to take is, um, you know, when again, when those interventions have not yielded progress is to make a referral for evaluation if it suspects that the student is a child with a disability. Remember, appropriate referrals for evaluation will clearly document how the language acquisition process was considered and addressed. Um, again, in case you missed it, the presentation last week um, went very much into detail on this process. And of course, um, as we all know, the topic of RTI and MTSS for ELLs is much bigger than 10 minutes. Um, so remember, as you're working with your team to better the system on your campus and your district, bring the expertise, the research, the talking points regarding language and cultural considerations to the table for the student. In conclusion, differentiation is the critical to both instruction and intervention of culturally and linguistically um, diverse students. The caveat here is that one size does not fit, fit all when it comes to the unique needs of our diverse students. We provided some tips for you um, to ensure equity and access. Tip number one, be mindful of teacher talk versus student talk. Tip number two, research shows that we spend less than two minutes a day teaching vocabulary. Also, take time to evaluate yourself on the amount of time you allot for academic language um, development through oral language development. Tip number three, remember you don't have to be bilingual in order to offer native language resources and support. And tip number four, this stresses the importance of the MTSS process. Tip number five, we tie it all together with collaboration. Sound familiar? We leave you with this final thought. Educational leaders must be willing to disrupt the school system that has marginalized students in the name of equity and social justice. Dr. Jose Medina. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to both of our presenters. Um, I encourage you, hang on, we have question and answer coming up. A lot of you have been uh, putting your questions in the Q&A area, so uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But of course, what we always like to do before getting to Q&A is we like to share with you what is happening next week, just a quick preview. So next week, we have a fan favorite coming back. Darina sackman Ebwa is going to join us. And this webinar is specifically um, for those of you out there who uh, have Saddlebacks or have always wanted Saddlebacks Welcome Newcomers Library. And you're looking for um, some ideas for how you would implement and differentiate using these fantastic resources. So Darina is going to come and share her expertise and how she used these materials with her students. So um, be on the lookout for that. We encourage you to register on our website or you should be receiving an email as well. Uh, and that will be at three o'clock Eastern time. 
All right, and with that, ladies, let's move on to question and answer. Great presentation. We had a lot of um, people chatting in, in the chat area and, and definitely some, some questions. Now, I want to start with, um, I guess this is not directly a question that was submitted, but while you were presenting, I was reading through the chat and I was getting a sense of the, um, the energy and some of the emotion uh, there behind people's um, curiosity and interest in this topic. Uh, there's some frustration out there, I think, potentially with some, some teachers who feel like they're butting up against these systems and um, they're trying to do right by their students. So as, as school district leaders who are, who are leading this work, I just wonder if you have any, um, any tips or, or advice you have for somebody in a classroom who wants to advocate for disrupting the systems. Like what, what would you tell a frustrated teacher who came to you and said, I, I know all this, but I can't see, I need to get somebody else to see this. What do you think? Tammy. Well, we'll start with Tammy. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of our teammates is actually on today, Annette um, Mendoza is on, and I know she's going to laugh when we share this story because we had another teammate, um, Chris, and he, his saying was always, you know, get up, walk down the hall, get walking, get walking. And so really what he meant in the context of that was building relationships, right? So walking down the hall and, uh, you know, if you're the English learner teacher, really building that partnership with the special education teacher. Um, you know, you know the saying, none of us get into education for the money, right? We're all here for the students. So really trying to build a relationship and um, collaboration with your colleagues that also have the same end goal, which is supporting the student um, and working together to see, you know, how you can disrupt the system. So that's where I would start um, personally is really um, working on building those relationships with my colleagues. Um, Chara, what would you like to add? Um, I want to say that you have already started today by being here today and, and learning how to break free of Tawadi and disrupt the systems. You've already made your first step and I want to congratulate you on that. Um, now we talk about your second step and the second step is to look at what is it that the student is in need of and when you bring it back to us, I think Liz said it best when she said, we are all um, advocates, we're all student advocates, and we all have that same baseline. And um, with that, and having that understanding, how can we help the student? So you've already done step one, step two, look at that student's need. And then how, as we as experts from I don't know who the other person it is that you're meeting, whether it's a special education teacher or if it's the administrator, I don't, I don't know, but um, I believe that we're all in there and we're um, focused on student achievement and um, success and then honoring that and collaborating as Tammy said is step number two. Um, so that's, I hope that helps. Thank you for addressing that. I think um, a lot of times, um, you have to, I think, control what you can control. And as Tammy said, building those relationships within your building and um, trying to strengthen the process within your building on your campus. And when great things start to happen where you are, people will start to take notice and there will, there will be a ripple effect there. Uh, and, and while we would all love it if the people above us would, would make the changes that we wanna see and have them trickle down, uh, maybe depending on what situation you're in, um, the the, most efficient thing you can do is just start with your local environment and, and try to improve that as much as possible and start that chain reaction that way. So uh, thank you ladies for, for sharing that. We did have a couple of questions um, around, now our presenters are not diagnosticians, but we did have a couple of questions around the language of, um, of assessment. So, um, how do you determine the best language for an educational evaluation? Um, so there's been, there was some chatter around that as well. Um, so do either of you have any experience on, do we have to give it in L1 if available, or is, are, is there like a particular instrument or any thoughts around that? Sure, sure. Well, and of course that's always a tricky question and, um, you know, that's the beautiful thing about special education. It's very individualized, right? So there is no cookie cutter answer. 
Um, but I did see in the Q and A also, you know, some questions like you said about specific instruments. Um, you know, and my response would be to always refer to the technical manual for each evaluation. Um, you know, an assessment battery, because it will tell you, you know, how it can be used and for what purposes um, that it's defensible. Um, I have been in districts uh, where they've used the WJ um, oral language pieces as part of a complete picture and diagnostic picture um, for that language. So, you know, I'll, I would also want to, in Texas, we use lost links for um, L identification and progress monitoring. So the LPAT could provide updated um, standardized information that way with um, lost links, for example, in English and Spanish. We have iStation um, monthly assessment data. We can get that in English and Spanish. We would have um, DRA and EDL, which is a, a reading assessment. We can get that data, teacher input, parent input, of course, and um, you know historical schooling. What language of instruction um, have they been receiving in school? Um, you know, historically, what does that look like? So I think that all needs to come together to complete a, you know, to form a complete picture. A lot like what the presenter last week said, there's no just, um, you know, you give this one test and you have your answer. Um, it's very complex and, um, you know, peeling the onion like she talked about. Um, I also wanted to mention, I know in Texas, we have the Texas um, Educational Diagnosti Diagnosticians Association, TEDA. So most states are going to have some sort of, you know, state level um, educational association with local affiliates. And I, you know, I highly encourage that because I've, I've been in districts where I am the department, <laughs> the one and only, and sometimes you just need a thought partner, right? So, um, you know, finding ways to reach out and, and connect with people to collaborate with and to think through, they may have a system in place that you can um, look at and, you know, use to form your own. So um, definitely um, multiple pieces that are included in adding or, or determining um, an evaluation plan. Awesome. I think you just answered the, the next question I was going to ask, um, which was around, is there some sort of like uh, one place I can, like a clearinghouse of, of different assessment instruments in different languages for, for people who, who need to know? And I, perhaps consulting with your state um, association of diagnosticians would probably be the, the place to go for that because they would know where the resources uh, for that type of thing is. Okay, this one is specifically, I think, um, Oh, I'm sorry, Tammy, did you want to add something to that? Just that also, um, I know sometimes, you know, different states, we have our educational service centers that support local school districts, like in their region, and they usually have a special education evaluation person too that could help with that. Great advice, thank you. Um, this next question, um, I, I really want to start with Chara for, for the answer to this question. Um, this was a question that came in through the registration process. Um, what somebody signed up and submitted this question and this person wanted to know if you have any suggestions uh, for else who've been identified with disabilities who struggle with showing proficiency on WIDA access in Texas we don't have WIDA but we use something similar called TELPASS so if a student of an L with a disability is struggling with showing proficiency on TELPASS or WIDA access uh, and continuously does not meet exit criteria um, for uh, ESL services, what, what suggestions um, do you have for that particular context, Chara? Um, I would really look at the level, their proficiency level, where that student is, and then look at the tools and the instruction that is being provided to that student. So um, at times, we, we fall into twatty, right? And so, um, we are in this phase that we do the same thing that we've always done, yet we expect our students to increase in their level. And um, when we have a student, it's like for special education teachers, they have, if I say, hey, the student is a beginner, but if I don't know what instruction a beginner needs, what supports a beginner needs, then how can I help raise that beginner to an intermediate level? And so we wanna just look at you know, those kinds of things. Look at proficiency level, look at instruction that's being provided, look at interventions that are being provided, and what scaffolds are being there, what online resources, accommodations, modifications, and then that's what's going to help move that student to that next level. Um, 
elevation is a good resource because it shows you specifically how you take a beginner and you move him to an intermediate. So if you want a, if, if someone's at a beginner level, then you want them to be an intermediate. These are the things, these are the type of instruction tools. These are the scaffolds. This is what you need to be doing to get them to that next level. And um, I think that's really important looking at the, um, looking at the level, looking at the instruction, and then trying to fill those gaps and moving them up. I think that will help that struggling student and that teacher have a targeted goal because they're thinking about what's the end in mind and they're, they're forward thinking and with their instruction and their target, they're, they're um, intentional. Great answer. Tammy, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Or no, Chara covered it, huh? Chara covered all that ground. Okay, I have two more questions and then, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, we had a specific question around, um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, strategies or um, if we could give this person direction around um, English learners with significant cognitive disabilities. So um, this is a question that popped up last week as well, though I'm not sure that we got to it live, but uh, you are going to have that segment of the population uh, that has um, significant cognitive disabilities. And um, is, is there a, a resource or any guidance or support uh, for teachers who are working um, with, with a, uh, this student with a significant uh, cognitive disability? There is, there's, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna find it and put it in the resource folder, but there is, um, some research out of a university in Wisconsin, I think it's University of Wisconsin, they have a grant that they hold and they put out a nice resource on this topic with um, L's with disabilities um, for significant cognitive disabilities. I'll see if I can find that. It's a very nice document and they're doing a lot of work on that. What we did in um, Dallas together with, um, my, with the team there, we worked a lot with the special education teachers on sheltered instruction strategies on second language acquisition methods. Um, what we found was a lot of the self contained special education components, um, their standards, their um, methods that they use align very nicely with the second language acquisition methods, such as um, visuals right. Um, breaking down vocabulary, pre-teaching vocabulary, uh, visual, visuals with vocabulary, routines, um, adapted text, all of that um, lined up very nicely. And as we began to work with the special education teachers on those um, methods and you know, planning for them intentionally, we saw good progress with that. Um, also in Texas, of course, we now have the Telpass alternate which includes those alternate proficiency standards. So that's something that, you know, to become familiar with and read over it. I saw someone in the chat was talking about um, access and I think that's the WIDA test. Mm -hmm. And I thought they had an alternative or alternate, um, but I'm not sure. So definitely, you know, reviewing that, but um, that's what we did and found the most progress with was um, really teaching the self-contained teachers about those shelter instruction methods. And I see someone put in the chat the answer for um, the document I was talking about. Um, Altella, that's right. From that's Wisconsin. right. They do great. And they're saying there there is an alternate access test uh, as well. So um, great. And this is uh, one last question. I, I think oh, we. Uh, Liz, can I can I answer that one too? If oh, you absolutely. Yes, please. Uh, I will. I will answer that question from an instructional point of view. Um, we have teachers who are struggling, they're like, they come to us with problems or situations. I'm a FLS, we have functional living skills or ADL teacher. And I need to, my, my students are at home. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. They come to us with these kind of um, con concerns. So what we'll do is for one teacher, she had her lesson in PowerPoint presentation. She had it going, but then she had to figure out how do I reach my student who is doing online learning. And then I need to know what are some possible platforms and whatnot. And so to help and provide that engagement, we use the platform, two platforms in one. We use Nearpod and with Nearpod, we can make it so that the students can circle or draw or point and that student can, um, that teacher can gain data 
in real time while that student is at home and they can see the students work in that platform and all they have to do is touch circle um, and so that was really helpful and then um, for our district they want them to put the things in seesaw and so you can also take that and embed a link and link those two platforms together so um, our cognitive our cognitive disability students who are really low we can still reach them instructionally um, by using other platforms um, while we are on this um, online virtual setting and provide those supports and um, services there you go Thank you, a very important perspective. Um, and I like how we answered that from, from the two different angles as well. Um, I think our attendees are, are very happy with this information. Um, I just wanted to close out uh, with this last thought. And, and, and I feel like we actually already spoke to this with, with that initial question, but we had somebody write in who talked about disagreements between um, ELL teachers and special education teachers around when or if students should be referred, tested, or serviced within the special education umbrella. So, so if I'm on a campus and I'm having, um, and that's my reality, where the, um, the, the, the teaching team, so to speak, are not um, necessarily seeing the same thing, or maybe are having disagreements that is um, slowing down um, the, the, the process, um, what advice do you have uh, for for that teacher and we'll we'll start this one with with Chara and then close it out with Tammy Later, but I'm also a ESL educator, so I know both sides. I know how as um, you know, with ESL, you have someone coming to you. Sometimes they don't give you enough time and they want you to come to the art meeting or they want something at the drop of a hat. But then I also know being on the other side, how that feels you're like, oh no, I forgot. I have to have an LPAC representative. If I don't have someone there, I'm gonna have to redo this IEP meeting. It's important that we each, um, Tammy touched on this in our presentation, we each respect um, the other person and as an expert and what I mean that is breaking free of those silos um, I respect you because I know that you are the language as far as the ESL bilingual shelter teacher you are the language acquisition specialist but then the special education educator I respect you because you are the instructional specialist you can show me differentiation tools and scaffolds and because each one of these resources um, brings special things to support that whole child. Um, within ESL, we have certain resources that we can offer, such as was mentioned. But then in special education, we have certain services that we can offer. And each of these two systems working together benefits the whole child. And that's what we're trying to do is benefit the whole child. So if y'all are not in agreement, it may be because somewhere we've lost the the um, collaboration, the respect, something may have been um, happened there. However, um, we can start today. Break free of Tawadi, take them a muffin or a salad as Annette has done in the past, and um, let's start a positive relationship. Start with that R collaboration form and um, let's focus on the student and what the student needs and then the resources that are provided through ESL, bilingual and um, special education to help move um, that student forward. Thank you. Tammy, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? No, I think Chara did a really great job answering that and it definitely is a tough situation. Um, you know, when you have people, uh, you know, who don't want to work together or who can't, but you know, when I'm in that situation, I really just try to take a step back, reflect on myself, what can I control, like you said, Liz, um, earlier, really focus on trying to build a relationship. Um, collaboration, you know, is not going to happen if you don't have trust and um, camaraderie and, um, you know, a willingness to work together. So really, what can you do to help establish that? Um, there was a lot of pieces in that question. You know, I wrote some down about the referral, you know, the referral process. Um, and then, you know, the services. So definitely, um, you know, when you're in that um, IEP meeting and they're discussing the services, 
make sure again to advocate for how will the IEP address the language needs for the students. Um, and again, for that individual student, right? So um, there's a different ways there that you can um, advocate for the student. But again, um, I do know that it doesn't happen overnight. But, um, you know, again, consistent and just don't let it, you know, don't not bring it up again because you didn't get the answer you wanted the first, you know, 99 times. Keep going, keep going, keep going because it's coming from a good place, which is serving students um, and helping them be successful. Thank you, ladies, so much. We are at time. So uh, for everybody who joined us in the middle of the day today, we appreciate you. Uh, you can find Saddleback online or uh, anywhere on social media that you are, we're there too. So check us out. And uh, this recording will be on our YouTube channel as well. Um, thank you, Chara Christopher, Tammy Sanchez, for sharing your knowledge with us today. And to all of you out there, thank you for all the work you do and thank you for your dedication uh, to improving your craft. Um, we see it on every webinar you come to join us because you, you want to be at your absolute best for your students. And for that, we, we thank you. And we will see you next week with uh, Miss Dorito, Dorina Sackman-Ebwa. Take care, everybody.